If you were to present the idea and story of Slipknot to somebody completely unaware of the band and their achievements, it would probably cause a lot of confusion. A group of rejects from the middle of nowhere dressing up in Halloween costumes and smashing trash cans with baseball bats is weird enough. What makes it even weirder is that same group of rejects have developed a brand that has become so popular and influential in pop culture that it's become more of a full-scale media brand than just the band. Festivals, clothing, hockey pucks, you name it, Slipknot have slapped their name and branding on it in hopes that somebody who looks like this will purchase at least seven of them. What seems to contrast the sheer size and let's say revenue capability of the band today is their humble beginnings, hailing from what is essentially a d hole, the band had to decide between working at a gas station or making music. I think I know what I'd choose. Let's explore the early days of Slipknot and see how on earth cheap Halloween masks have resulted in one of the most popular and affluent metal bands. Before we can understand the origins of Slipknot, we first need to understand the location in which they were from, Des Moines, Iowa commonly described as a hole with buildings around it. If that doesn't give you a good enough idea, I've prepared a few images to accurately describe a place I've never visited within the country I've never visited. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? In 1995, this mother and this slightly less well-known mother would decide to start a band, specifically basing the band on the role-playing game Werewolf the Apocalypse, which essentially means, in a different universe, one of the most popular metal bands on the planet is a group of furries. You see? There isn't much to do in Iowa, meaning around this time the early members were playing children's board games, welding and consistently creating new bands, and as the werewolf inspired band began to fall apart, Crayon and Colsefni would invite future member Paul Gray to a new band, as well as beginning the constant barrage of invitations towards Joey Jordanson to come play drums for the band. After being nagged enough, Joey would finally make his way down to the stinky basement. The stench of B.O. and rubber alongside the crippling wall of distortion convinced them to join the band full time. They decided on their name Meld. The creative juices would really start flowing with their main meeting spot being a gas station and practice spot being a cramped basement. Somehow the smell of petrol and damp wood actually worked as the band would begin writing songs such as Gently, Killers Are Quiet and of course Slipknot, which would eventually become their name. That should be obvious, silly. The petrol fumes seemed to get them at a deeper level as they decided they needed three drummers, one on each side of the stage and one in the middle. They did this before they hired a second guitarist. Around this time they were still maskless, choosing to show off their sweaty paws to every crowd they performed for. This wouldn't last long as the band would inevitably get bored of the name Meld and decided on Slipknot. This would be around the time where the Slipknot concept would begin to develop more towards what is seen today. They were even kicking out members without explanation. Some things never change. Sean Crayon would turn up to a practice session with a clown mask on. This coincided perfectly with the band specifically focusing on building the spectacle of their live shows. They agreed almost unanimously that masks would be worn during live performances and immediately scouted their local costume stores for masks that fit the aesthetic. Early on, the band focused heavily on going against trends and forming a sort of anti-image, meaning the masks fit perfectly, helping them appear more faceless. 1995 would see the release of the band's first demo. While I say release, they basically just handed it out to close friends. Apparently each physical demo is slightly different, as each of the band members drew different album art, which is cool, Daniel Johnston type beat. After this demo, the members decided to try their hand at studio production and recording. Sound engineer Sean McMahon would stroll into the filthy basement, extremely confused as to what the f*** he was looking at. All he knew is that it sounded good, and the band got the go-ahead to begin working on a full project, Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat. The recording process would go exactly how you'd expect for a project of this name. They had a rule of extreme extreme violence. As a conflict resolution tool during practice, the walls around the practice area would become full of punch holes and Jordison would actually drum naked for one of the songs. They also ran into a few issues. Firstly, guitarist Donnie Steele would find God and kind of realised this whole Slipknot degeneracy goes against my entire religion, so promptly quit the band. They replaced them with eventual sampler Craig Jones who originally played guitar. They also had to figure out a way to mix three percussionists alongside the rest of the instrumentation. During the mixing stages, they decided to play their first master show looking like this. They would actually change outfits regularly, and I don't mean like minor mask changes. Sean Crane rented out a Barney suit for a show. They would wear nun dresses, ballroom dresses, you name it, all whilst using a power sword to send sparks into the crowd. Before the 1996 release of Mate Feed Kill Repeat, the band chucked Craig Jones on the sampler and enlisted Mick Thompson to replace him on guitar. Although still very small and niche, the band were building a decent cult following, with many fans wearing masks to the shows in which they played. This resulted in a few festival gigs as well as some attention from 
Roadrunner Records, although they turned the band down due to the singer not being melodic enough. Although success was coming their way, the band were having issues, lack of time and weak relationships. This all culminated in a festival set where they had plans to set themselves on fire before being cut short and harassing the audience with flying CDs. They decided they needed a new singer and approached Corey Taylor at his workplace, saying, join our band or we'll kick your ass. Corey agreed for some reason and began recording and performing with the band. This time period would also see the short-lived member Cuddles, who would basically break the stage before being kicked out. The acquisition of Taylor would prove beneficial, as Roadrunner Records would sign them in 1998 for a seven-album deal. The band packed up and travelled to Malibu to begin recording their self-titled debut. Slipknot during this time consisted of pretty much all the original well-known members, with Chris Fain, Sid Wilson and Jim Root being added to the mix. Only issue is, they already had shot promo and album cover material, meaning they had to photoshop the new members onto the material. They finished the recording of Self Titled in 1999. The mixing and mastering of this album would prove even more challenging, but that's mainly because they refused to use digital methods, opting for only analogue instead. The completion of the album would be followed by a few shows. At this point their stage attire was actually cool and coherent, as opposed to poorly constructed Halloween costumes or bondage gear. By far the most important show would be their performances at Ozfest, which would skyrocket their popularity. This would be combined with more tours, one of which being so hot that many of the members passed out multiple times during shows. That might have had something to do with the jumpsuits, I'm not going to lie. self title would be released in December 1999, officially going platinum in May 2000. You'd think this success would promote positivity and an eagerness to create and record more music within the same style. Nope. The recording of Iowa is seen as the darkest period in the history of the band. The lack of any sort of break after touring combined with and resulting in a recording process that was essentially hell. Suddenly all the members were caught up in a typical rock and roll lifestyle. This combined with a ridiculous amount of pressure, not only from fans but the other members within the band, caused the band members to struggle mentally. Corey Taylor would go on to extreme lengths to achieve vocals, getting naked, vomiting, you name it. All this pain would be combined with numerous mental breakdowns, accidents resulting in injury, and the death of Sid Wilson's grandfather which resulted in the screaming on the intro track. Despite all the disagreements and issues recording, they mutually agreed to get new masks custom made, specifically designed to fit the band members' faces. The album would be released in August 2001, peaking at number 3 in the US and number 1 in the UK. Despite their continued success, they were all getting a little bit too silly and decided to take hiatus so each of the members could work on other projects. Each of the members seemed to actually disagree on whether the band would get back together and whether there was even any tension in the first place. Despite this, they would get back together in 2003. This time they would do it right. After years of disagreements and drug issues, they thought the best idea. Let's all live in a mansion together named the Houdini Mansion and force ourselves to record music. Of course, this went exactly as expected and the band members didn't speak for three months, although eventually began writing and recording, bringing on Rick Rubin for production. Upon release, Volume 3, the Subliminal Verses would actually perform well and actually resulted in their first Grammy for Before I Forget. 2008 would see the release of All Hope Is Gone, again debuting at number one although nowhere near the same quality as their first three albums in my eyes. This is where the Slipknot story begins to become tragic, with Paul Gray and Joey Jordison passing away in 2010 and 2021 respectively, as well as many of the key members leaving or being removed with little to no explanation. The band would continue to release projects that seem lacklustre in my eyes, although would build massive popularity, even founding a festival named Knotfest. I'm not going to go into huge detail about the period since All Hope Is Gone, as I see it as not only sad but boring in comparison to their early story, essentially just a and lawsuits, business decisions, and a worn down edge turned the band into more of a media powerhouse than a musical act, like they allegedly sued Burger King for allegedly utilizing a band with masks for advertising. That's all allegedly a corporate that he's got. I respect the hustle and the fact that they've been able to go from Iowa to one of the most recognizable acts in the world is extremely admirable. I just don't care about these Tortilla Man or Tortilla Man or 50 year old men arguing about royalties to a band full of Halloween mask wearing freaks.